Hello, pod smashers of the internet, and welcome to the sixth episode of Termite's Buzz, a weekly video game podcast where I, your host, Termite, will run you through what trophies and games I'm playing, what news has happened this week in the gaming industry, and wrap it all up with a fun little retro gaming discussion at the end. As I said earlier, I'm your host, Termite, and you can find out more about the things that I have done and who I am and what's going on with me over at 80bitpodsmash.com. That's a landing website for our podcast, and I say our because I used to do a weekly video game podcast with a host named Penguin, whom I miss very much and want to come back to doing our 80-bit pod smash show after five years plus of episodes. We've decided to take a hiatus to kind of re-establish what the brand will be. And you can find all of those episodes also at 80bitpodsmash.com. I hope to find you all well on this rainy Friday morning that I am recording. I am first time recording in the morning, so I actually do have coffee today. And I do want to stress a little bit here about coffee to not take it for granted. Because if you enjoy coffee, if you're a coffee drinker like myself, you'll know that it is a lifeline that it is sometimes more important than other needs like clothes and showering. And so whenever we travel, I have to make sure we have coffee. I need to know where it is. I need to know how I can get it. And I need to know if I need to bring it with me and prepare ahead of time. Because if you don't have coffee, bad things happen. Crankiness, bitterness, massive headaches. It's pretty awful. So coffee's amazing. I don't see anything bad with it at all, except for that little addiction on the side where your body becomes physically dependent on caffeine. And you can mitigate some of those symptoms with caffeine pills or tea or energy drinks in lieu of coffee, but coffee is wonderful. It smells good, tastes good, it's great. I hope that... Uh, I like. I also like to raise awareness about fair trade coffee. That's what I was going to say. I hope. I hope that people know about this, but coffee is extremely difficult to grow and harvest. It's extremely labor-intensive. And if you know the whole process of growing coffee beans, or at least the cherries, and gutting, pitting them, pulling the beans out, and then the roasting process to the point where you get a bag in your grocery store, or online, or wherever you're buying it from, the retailers, it's a lot of work, and people deserve a fair wage. So we're drinking fair trade coffee this morning, uh, and it is delicious. So there's that. Without further ado... Let's jump into what's going on in the world of Termites Gaming. I am still playing and on the high of Metroid Prime that was released last week after Nintendo's Direct. Of course, that was Shadow Dropped, famously. It reviewed 9s and 10s, and so it has an open critic score of, I believe, 93 or 4. In fact, you know, I should pull this up. Open critic. Because I am a part of a fantasy league that no one grabbed this. 95 which would have been worth a whopping 30 points if anyone had had that in my league, which they don't. I'm in a league with the Flock podcast and Penguin. Uh, and fantasy, the Fantasy Critic League is a league where I am like a publishing company and I choose to publish games. So I've selected games that I think will review well and we're scored on the review scores. So anything over 80 or anything over 70 is worth one point. Uh, and for example... Hogwarts Legacy, I someone in our league has that, just came out, and it's reviewing at an 84, so that's 14 points. So that's why I care about this. So yeah, I'm on the high of Metroid Prime. It's wonderful, absolutely incredible. I'm still slowly kind of working my way through that game as a back burner game. It's really, really difficult to roll in older retro replay titles or even like to stack multiple games in my hopper at once, if you will, my proverbial hopper of games I'm currently playing. So still playing that, still absolutely loving it. The remaster is amazing. If you have a Nintendo Switch and you have any drive at all, the physical version's coming out soon. You can pick it up there or you can get it on the eShop now. Uh, Metroid Prime is one of the greatest games of all time. I know if I were to make a list of my favorite games of all time, it would be really high on that list. Metroid Prime is absolutely wonderful. The vibe, the atmosphere, the gameplay mechanics, the exploration scanning, the puzzles, the backtracking you have to do, it's flawless. It plays wonderfully. It's smooth 60 frames per second on the GameCube and on the Switch. And it just blew blew up when it first came out. Like, there's just no way a game can be that good still 20 years later, 22 years later. So here we are. I don't know when a game came out. 20 years ago, 2003? Sounds right. GameCube came out in 2001. Sometime back then is when Metroid Prime came out. Still awesome. Still amazing. And more modern games need to learn how to be better so that they can be like Metroid Prime. Just saying. It's good stuff. 
also still working my way through Hogwarts Legacy, which I have a little I have a little apology from myself as well as a little redaction, if you will, or at least uh, shed a little bit more light. So last week on the show, I immediately blasted J.K. Rowling, much like the internet was doing, about her transphobic views. Uh, of course, I'm still very much pro-trans rights. Trans rights matter. Trans lives matter. And if anyone has transphobic viewpoints, they should really be looking into themselves to figure out where that hate is coming from and why. And I still stand that way. However, there has been an opinion piece published on the New York Times and I'm going to link to that in the show notes for those who care. Uh, but I will read a segment of it, and then I will move on. I'm still playing it, but I just want to get the, I want to clear the air because I may have been wrong last week to condemn J.K. Rowling so quickly. And I want to read what this opinion piece, written by Pamela Paul from the New York Times. So she quotes J.K. Rowling saying this. So this is these are the words of J.K. Rowling: "Trans people need and deserve protection." I believe the majority of trans-identified people not only pose zero threat to others, but are vulnerable. I respect every trans person's right to live any way that feels authentic and comfortable to them. I feel nothing but empathy and solidarity with trans women who've been abused by men. These statements were written by J.K. Rowling, the author of Harry Potter series, a human rights activist according to, and according to a noisy fringe of the internet and number of a powerful transgender rights activists and LGBTQ lobbying groups, a transphobe. Even many of Rowling's devoted fans have made this accusation. In, in 2020, the Leaky Cauldron, one of the biggest Harry Potter fan sites, claimed that Rowling had endured, endorsed, quote, harmful and disproven beliefs about what it means to be a transgender person, end quote, letting members know it would avoid featuring quotes from and photos of the author. Other critics have advocated that bookstores pull her books from the shelves, and some bookstores have done so. She has also been subjected to verbal abuse, doxing, and threats of sexual and other physical violence, including death threats. Death threats are never okay. Be better, internet. This is ridiculous. Even if somebody is like this, they don't deserve death threats and physical violence threats or any infringement upon their lives. It's ridiculous. You're the internet. It's content. It's entertainment. Now, in rare and wide-ranging interviews for the podcast series, quote, A Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, which is coming out next week, Rowling is sharing her experiences. Quote, I have had direct threats of violence, and I have had people coming to my house where my kids live, and I've had my address posted online. She says in one of the interviews, quote, I've had what the police, anyway, would regard as credible threats. The campaign against Rowling is as dangerous as it is absurd. The brutal stabbing of Salman Rushdie last summer is a forceful reminder of what can happen when writers are demonized. And in Rowling's case, the characterization of her as a transphobe doesn't square with her actual views. So the article goes on to basically say she has been misrepresented by the internet and this podcast that she's doing and this round of PR, if you will, uh, is kind of putting that at the center and making us all realize that this situation is a lot more nuanced and there's a lot more going on here than what um, has happened. So this is a typical case of cancel culture at its worst, where some words are taken out of context. J.K. Rowling still has a responsibility to use her platform appropriately, and she has failed to do so in that regard. So I still hold that against her. Uh, you shouldn't say things on Twitter that can be twisted and turned into things and i'm not going to victim blame these people who are like actually threatening physical violence and posting her address online and going after her family and children are absolutely wrong in every way shape and form that is no way to respond to someone who has a differing viewpoint than you it's awful and it's terrible it's toxic this kind of stuff runs rampant in the gaming industry when developers and publishers produce a game or when journalists and podcasters have a viewpoint that is counter cultural, if you will, or counter mainstream viewpoints, uh, people just go crazy. Sakurai, the maker of Smash Bros, was th targeted with death threats and violence because of decisions in Smash Brothers. Like, come on. Absolutely ridiculous. But the point here is a lot of people were boycotting Hogwarts Legacy a lot of people were speaking out against the game. There was a lot of moral gray area for even buying it and enjoying it. And I'm here to say that there's a lot more to this story. Stay tuned for that podcast. I know I will. And if you care at all about it, go for it. Check it out. So I'm going to say that first. Hogwarts Legacy is great. The game is wonderful. I think I've talked last week about how I love some of the random environment storytelling and some of the little events that were... Uh, 
having like music being played in the corner and like portraits yelling out at you and saying things while the quests continue to move forward and i've now kind of branched out of the castle and i've done some things into the forbidden forest and found out like some underground caves and things the puzzles have been easy uh but the game is fun i'm enjoying the story the intrigue and the mystery continues to unfold slowly i think it's paced well as you find a new thing that reveals something different about what's going on it ties in the history of this fifth year student the main character with what's happening at hogwarts just like the books kind of did with harry being entered into hogwarts and there's like all this stuff going on even in the third book the prisoner of azkaban when you start talking about Sirius black and like all of the things that they did and then you get into the later books and you find out voldemort's workings with the dark wizards and all that so the game is very analogous to the how the books unfold the story so there's all this stuff happening outside of hogwarts with a villain uh, and it's really really cool to see how it quick uh, slowly trickle effects like comes out into the open as you discover and open up more things so it's a lot of fun i'm enjoying even the side character interactions uh like with student to student high school well high school drama if you will just silly kid stuff uh, i think that's just makes it a little bit more realis- real realistic and authentic in its experience as a fifth year student at school so you're still dealing with those things and being a child like growing up coming of age kind of thing so i love it and i'm nowhere near the end the game is huge so i'm still playing that and then the biggest thing that happened this week and the thing i am the most excited about is the release of theater rhythm final bar which is final fantasy theater rhythm it's an arcade game in japan i think there's some in america a couple of entries on the 3ds and now the newest entry on playstation 4 it boasts over like 350 songs it's a rhythm game centered around the final fantasy franchise and it is absolutely wonderful the game is incredible i love rhythm games i love final fantasy so putting the two together is just mm, chef's kiss and they did a great job with layering on rpg mechanics with a rhythm game and yes you heard that correctly rpg mechanics in a rhythm game you have a party that made up of different types of characters physical magical hunter defense and they have abilities and there is strategy involved in some of the level goals so as you play through quote unquote the campaign or the single play there's little goals that go along with the song such as defeat this boss in 15 seconds or defeat 20 enemies or like cast a spell or do a summon like 10 times so in order to achieve those goals which are tied to trophies you have to construct your party in such a way that does that that achieves those things so like i don't know all of the strategies yet but i do know that you can combine multiple characters and give them certain abilities to achieve those goals and i think that is really really cool even as you miss notes mid song you have a health bar that goes down and you can use healers to kind of get you back so you don't actually fail or get a game over in the song i'm very excited to continue playing i've gone through i think five entire games so each game has like 15 to 20 songs and so i'm not you know i'm just scratched the surface i'm very excited uh all of the there's a lot of respect given to the Final Fantasy games. Like, I played through the Final Fantasy Tactics songs already, and there's only, like, seven songs, unfortunately. It's one of the more shallow games as far as the music content is concerned. But each of the levels that you walk through with the characters, when you play a rhythm, this, you play a song, it, like, loads up a level, and the characters either walk from side to side or they're fighting something. The backgrounds are pulled right out of the game. So some of the songs from Final Fantasy Tactics were the songs that played during a specific battle in the story of Final Fantasy Tactics, and they had that level in theater rhythm. So it was like the song matched the environment, and then, of course, you have your theater rhythm party fighting a bunch of random enemies, which is not Final Fantasy Tactics, but it was really, really cool. It just paid homage to the original Final Fantasy games, and each of them do that. So Final Fantasy 1, 2, 7, 9, all of them have the stages from their games with the music that happened in the game. Uh, so it's wonderful. It's awesome. I highly recommend it. if you have any interest at all. It's super approachable. Uh, the, there's difficulty scaling, and so you can keep it at the easiest difficulty and still get it if you're bad at rhythm games, but it's also incredibly depth deep. It has a lot of depth if you want to turn the difficulty up. I know I'm playing right now kind of in the mi- middle difficulty, and I would consider myself like pretty good at rhythm games. And so there's a lot of rhythm games each have their own kind of i don't know how to explain this but like language and it's not just timing the button presses at the right time i mean that's obviously the the first and foremost mechanic that you're dealing with so even in guitar hero you have four buttons and you have them scrolling on the screen you press the right button at the right time and you get that note but 
there becomes like a meta version of that where your brain kind of learns patterns, pattern recognition, and you have muscle memory developing. So when you see a pattern of notes, like you, your fingers just move. Well, theater rhythm has the same thing. And what's tripping me up is I will get the timing correct, but I press the wrong button or I do the wrong thing. So you can tap buttons on the face, like the square triangle X buttons cross, I should say. It's cross, not X. Fight me. That's what it's called. Sony calls it cross. That's the owners of the content. They get to name it. It's cross, not X. Square triangle circle cross buttons. Also, you have to flick the joystick and you have to hold buttons sometimes. And when you hold a button, you it combines holding of buttons with flicking of joysticks and it gets crazy complicated. Apparently you're supposed to use the, the shoulder buttons and the triggers, which I haven't used. I've only been using the front facing ones. So maybe I can use that to leverage to get, get over a hump. But that's when songs get a little too difficult for me is when you start holding things and you can use the up, down, left and right or the square triangle circle cross buttons, however you want. So you have eight possible buttons for like to accomplish one tap or you can hold two buttons at once and it doesn't matter which two you hold. So it's very flexible in how you want to play. I'm the kind of gamer that needs a little bit more direction. So when given the whole controller, you can just, any button you would like, I'm like, I uh, kind of want to know which one to use. So I'm trying to figure that out myself. And I think that is the biggest hurdle for me to get into the harder difficulties because it's not the timing and the understanding of the buttons. It's this meta language of how to, and each rhythm game is unique. So Guitar Hero has its own and from theater rhythm, from Dance Dance Revolution. And if you played Thumper or if you played Amplitude, like they all have their unique kind of language that your body needs to learn in muscle memory so that you can just do the things. And it's impossible to kind of brute force it where you're just thinking about which button to press at the right time. That's not how, like, I don't think anyone, if you, I could be wrong, but I don't think anyone gets good at rhythm games by just like turn the volume off and just press the buttons based on what you see and on the controller. Like it really does require you to be plugged in and know, like, then that's why they're rhythm games. Cause you play, you listen to the music and you hear the melody, you hear the beat, you feel, you feel the timing in your bones. It's great. It's wonderful. I love it. I love rhythm games and theater rhythm is my most favorite, more recent rhythm game coming off of the Persona dancing games, which I played uh, last winter and I approached Persona 4 dancing over the summer when I got back from Hawaii because I played Persona 4 on the plane to and from Hawaii all summer long and it was wonderful. I sunk like 60 hours total into Persona 4, if not more, and the music is dope. So I played Persona 4 dancing over the summer. Those rhythm games aren't as deep to me, the Persona ones, as Theater Rhythm is. Theater Rhythm is just awesome. And if I had to give my own review and my own rating so far, it would definitely be a 10 out of 10. It's perfect for a rhythm game. It's fantastic. So go check it out if you haven't. There's a free demo. You have nothing to lose. Just some time. With that, we're going to go into the news. What is going on this week in the world of gaming? Well, I will kick off the news segment with PlayStation Plus Games Catalog lineup for February is crazy. It's lit. So I'm going to read some stuff off the PlayStation blog, but I will, this is unprecedented amount of good quality content for a PlayStation plus game catalog, uh, lineup. So each month the PlayStation come, uh, there's, if you're a member of PlayStation plus, you get access to some free games. And with that, you have the tiers. So you have the standard, whatever it's called. You have the premium and then you have like the extra and added so each of those different tiers can get access to different types of games and so it's kind of the competitor to game pass in some ways the games come and go they can be removed the essential that's what the base package is called the playstation plus games added to the essential package or whatever which is the base it's what it's always been since the playstation 3 and vita era is a selection of games that you claim and as long as you're a member, you have them forever. You claim them in your library and you have access to them as long as you are in, you have an active subscription. So the premium and the extra tiers, the higher ones, those are the ones that have like a rotating list. So what we have here is the PlayStation Plus game catalog for February 2023. Uh, all of these games will come out on February 21st. So the essential ones have already dropped, which is kind of confusing. And those come out usually the first Tuesday of the month. So I'm actually going to look up PlayStation Plus Essential February 2023 before I get into the this craziness. And then I'll give some context as to why I'm even reporting about this. Because some people are like, what, what is going on? Why do you even care? Um, so Essentials this month were Destiny 2 Beyond Light, Ollie Ollie World, Evil Dead the Game, 
and Mafia Definitive Edition. And those came out February 7th. So if you are the lowest tier subscriber, you can claim those four titles and you will have them forever. As I always say, I'm going to get on my soapbox again. If you have any interest in PlayStation whatsoever and you're on PlayStation Plus, I don't know how much it costs, but if you're an essential member, please every month go claim every single game. It costs nothing and you have them in your library forever. I have a huge library of games stemming all the way back to the PlayStation 3 because whether I was playing them or not, I claimed every game from every single month and when I picked up my PlayStation Vita years late, I have a giant library of games to play that I caught that cost me nothing because I'm a member of PlayStation Plus and you do it every month. When those games go away and they cycle, like March 6th, these four games I just listed are gone. You cannot get access to them for free anymore. You have each month, you got to do it. And I subscribe to at Wario64 on Twitter and he will post immediately when those go live every month. And I go claim all four of them, all the titles. I even have like a huge library of PlayStation VR titles because they were giving away one VR title every month. And those stay with you forever. So that's the essentials. That's the core package. That's the that's what you get essentially for free if you're paying into the PlayStation Plus essential package to play online. It's the same entry. Like in order to play a game online, you got to have this subscription just like Xbox Live or whatever. Like this is PlayStation's version of that. Okay, so that's context. With those games, people are complaining that Sony is just throwing out crap games, they're not worth it, it's just garbage, it's shovelware, it's not good, where's the value? A lot of hubbub have been coming up lately about the offerings that Sony has been giving out each month. And if you go back to the podcast that Penguin and I did about Sony and how we feel like there's a pattern of price gouging or nickel and diming or increasing the prices and decreasing the value of what you get for the money that Sony kind of has this air about it. That's this boutique expensive and it's really difficult to get into the PlayStation uh, atmosphere ecosystem, if you will. Uh, I kind of rebutted against that a little bit, but I understand the argument and this is part of it, right? It's the PlayStation plus offerings aren't as good as the things that are coming to game pass where you can get first party Xbox games day and date. So here we go. There's the answer. This is setting the internet on fire. PlayStation Plus premium and extra offerings are Horizon Forbidden West, Resident Evil 7 Biohazard for PS5, The Quarry for PS5, Scarlet Nexus, Borderlands 3, and Outriders. Absolutely insane value. If you upgrade your membership to a premium or extra, and I'm not sure which is on which because it's confusing, and that is a critique against Sony for making a confusing tiered based subscription service so the blog the playstation blog says this and maybe it'll help clarify adam michael director of content acquisition and operations over at sony um says today we're happy to reveal the playstation plus game catalog for february 2023 all games will be available on tuesday february 21st playstation plus and extra and premium so i guess if you're on extra you can get this premium is the most expensive one extra is kind of the middle tier Yeah, Horizon Forbidden West, PS4, PS5, The Quarry, PS4, PS5, Resident Evil 7 for PS4. So I guess it's not the PlayStation 5 version. That's unfortunate because I want to transfer my trophies over. I already have Resident Evil 7 Biohazard. It was already on PlayStation Plus before. Uh, Outriders for PS4, PS5, Scarlet Nexus, PS4, PS5, Borderlands 3, PS4, PS5, Tekken 7 for PS4, Ace Combat 7 for PS4, Earth Defense Force 5 for PlayStation 4, Oninaki on PS4, Lost Sphere on PS4, I Am Setsuna for PS4, which if you remember, it's a JRPG that features a battle system and character designs inspired by past genre classics, namely Chrono Trigger. Uh, The Forgotten City on PS4, PS5, which is a a Roman city adventure. And then, to top all that off, if you're a member of PlayStation Premium, which is the most expensive tier, you get these PlayStation Classics. The Legend of Dragoon from PlayStation 1 is finally coming to a modern platform. That's super exciting. And I really, really hope that there's trophies with it. Not the who's got time, right? Another big Japanese RPG to sink teeth into. It's gonna be crazy. Wild Arms 2, again, another huge RPG. Harvest Moon, Back to Nature. And then Destroy All Humans from PlayStation 2. Uh, but it's actually like those PlayStation 2 games that are actually PS4 titles uh, somehow, like that's how they're they're ported to PS4 and then backwards compatible you played on PS5. Craziness. A lot of value here. 
one of the best months they've had in a very long time. So, of course, they're being praised. There's also some blowback from fans like myself who bought Horizon Forbidden West new last year when it had just came out. So here we are just a year later, one calendar year later, and you can already get it on a subscription service. This is the closest that Sony has ever come to releasing a brand new first party game on their subscription service. Again, Xbox is doing this day and day with Game Pass, right? So I'll get Atomic Heart the second it drops. I will get Starfield and Redfall the second they drop, the day they come out on Game Pass. So this is the next, like Sony is kind of answering it, right? Uh, I don't know what to think about it. I spent $70 on Horizon Forbidden West last year because Sony doesn't offer these things. But if they do start offering these things, if I can turn off the collector on in my brain like maybe i will not have to buy as many games but definitely leads to uh, an argument against price gouging sony right this is a very value based proposition having borderlands 3 available digitally outriders like great multiplayer games the quarry which is essentially the follow-up to uh until dawn and I was I almost bought that last year around Halloween because I wanted to play it and now it's going to be on the PlayStation extra tier so fun stuff good good things I don't have enough time to play what I've got much less adding these titles to the list to the pile the cool part is it doesn't really cost you anything extra unless you're paying extra for them to me it's free so I like to say it feels free that's that's what it is I have the subscription it happens and then these games I get to play for free what's next uh, Xbox Game Pass, not as good for game sales as we originally had thought. So back in 2018, Phil Spencer made a claim that Game Pass boosts game sales rather than undermines them. Well, this new account, this new article from Brendan Sinclair over at gamesindustry.biz claims that Xbox maker tells the UK Competition and Markets Authority's provisional report, so the CMA, Xbox Maker tells the CMA it expects titles to see a decline in base game sales for at least a year following inclusion into the subscription service. So here we go. I'm going to read the article. The UK Competition and Markets Authority's provisional report on the Microsoft Activision Blizzard acquisition includes an admission from Microsoft that putting games into its Game Pass subscription service cannibalizes the sale of those titles. Quote, Microsoft also submitted that its internal analysis shows a redacted percentage decline in base game sales 12 months following their addition on Game Pass, the CMA noted in its report. That confirms... That confirmation runs counter to the claims that Xbox head Phil Spencer made in 2018 that Game Pass boosts sales rather than undermines them. Quote, when you put a game like Forza Horizon 4 on Game Pass, you instantly have more players of the game, which is actually leading to more sales of the game, Spencer said, adding, you say, well, isn't everyone just going to subscribe for $10 and then go play this game? But no, gamers find things to play based on what everybody else is playing. So that was all the quote from Phil Spencer, which is now not true necessarily. Elsewhere in the CMA's report, it cites Microsoft as saying that Activision took a dim view on putting its titles into multi-game subscription services on any platform, believing that, quote, severely cannibalize buy-to-play sales, particularly in the case of newer releases. That's the end of that article. I think what we're seeing here is, like, Phil Spencer's not outwardly lying. He obviously has some insight into the internals of sales versus the subscription services, and he's quoting Forza Horizon 4, which is a first-party title, so I don't We don't know the details of what this means. It just says that Microsoft submitted an internal analysis that shows a percentage decline in base game sales 12 months following their addition to Game Pass. So is that a third-party game like from EA, a Ubisoft, or is it their first-party titles? Are some titles actually boosting sales, but most of them are decreased in sales, and so the the overall percentage is low? So This needs more nuance, but I'm reporting on this news article because it did come out. And it does seem to continue that this the acquisition, the Blizzard Activision acquisition, has really brought to light a lot of things. Uh, back when we were talking about Sony and how its strategies have shifted based on trying to combat this acquisition, uh, and some of the it's not lying, but it's definitely businessy contradictions. And obviously, consumers are not supposed to be caring about this and what we do because we want to know and we're interested and this is kind of our our thing but anyway there's a lot of nuance here we don't really know for sure what is profitable what's not because xbox never reports their game pass numbers they don't report the profit it makes uh and sometimes you get numbers of subscriptions subscribers and you can see that number go up and down and you can speculate based on how much it costs per month like how much they're bringing in but we have no clue what the business deals are for a per title basis we don't know 
what developers and publishers get by adding a game on Game Pass. We don't know how much it costs. If you and I decided we wanted to put together a video game and put it on Game Pass, what, what does that business model even look like? What do we get? What do they need? Like, what, what, what happens? So, this is good. I'm glad this came out. And I'm actually happy that this acquisition continues to bring to light more of the businessy side of the games industry, especially regarding Microsoft's Game Pass. Because while it is objectively the best deal in gaming, hands down, if you are strapped for cash and you want to play video games, you want to play the most amount of video games for the cheapest price, you can purchase an Xbox Series S console, theoretically used secondhand, for 200 or less dollars, and you can pay $10 a month to access Game Pass, and you have access to the craziest high-quality collection of video games, hands down. Like, awesome. So, consequently, if you wanted to do that with Sony, you could buy a PS5 used four to $500, depending on what you're getting, and you could pay $10 a month for PlayStation Plus or whatever the cheapest cost is, and you'll get a couple of free games each month. Or you can upgrade to their extra tier and get access to a bunch of games. A huge, And so that, that's the best deal for Sony, but it's still not as cheap as the Xbox's bottom-of-the-line entry point. So hands-down Game Pass is amazing, and it's definitely disrupting the game's market. And with that, I think I talked before about the vertical monopoly uh, and how it kind of is it affects competition and it affects the perceived value of video games in general and it pers- it changes the perspective of consumers as far as what they're willing to spend on games we also reported that legend of zelda tears of the kingdom was going to be 70 dollars instead of 60 and i was fine with it but that whole backlash for that is probably a result of a little bit of optics from game pass just knowing that there's a subscription out there that you can get a huge collection of games for seemingly nothing and then all of a sudden it cheapens the value and so it forces the competition like sony and nintendo to not be able to price competitively because they're competing against game pass and so it's not good for business it's not good for the industry overall the long term because that's how capitalism works with competition so i'm really really glad this acquisition is getting under scrutiny and there's a whole lot of stuff coming out of it and it will help shape the business decisions between developers and publishers and their platform makers, Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo. If you have a healthy relationship between developers, publishers, and the platform makers, then we get good games. We get better games, we get more of them. And not that I'm complaining about a lack of content. My backlog is huge. There's tons of stuff to play. But we don't want that to go away. We don't want Microsoft to come out like Amazon did and completely just squash all the competition and ruin our experiences elsewhere just so we could have Game Pass. So while I'm a Game Pass subscriber, and I absolutely love my my Game Pass selections, I'm currently playing Hi-Fi Rush a little on the side. Uh, I loved that it shadow dropped day and date. I'm looking forward to Starfield, and I will play those through Game Pass. I'm one to not buy Xbox games, just throwing that in the pot for like my who I am. I don't buy Xbox titles. I use Game Pass. So that actually supports this article, claiming that game sales decline, because you can just subscribe for $10 a month and go play the game. You don't have to buy it for 60 or $70. So there's that. On to the next thing. Incoming Pokemon Scarlet Violet patch. I have been clamoring to hear what in the world is going on. Nintendo or Pokemon Company, Game Freak, yeah, I don't know who. Someone from those entities promised that there would be updates and patches to Pokemon Violet and Scarlet from the backlash that was the enormous technical buggy mess that was those games. And so... <laughs> Uh, apparently update 1.2.0 is coming at the end of February and with it are a huge list of, of bug fixes. Uh, it's not the game changing patch, uh, because they still are adding new features. Additional functionality will be added for Pokemon boxes. Uh, a new screen will be displayed when you connect to the internet from the main menu, just as it is when connecting to the internet from the Poke portal. Those are useless features to me. I never found the box cumbersome, but I guess to some players, sure. Uh, Terror Raid Battles have a whole bunch of bugs. Battles in general have bug fixes. But what I care about and what I'm the most worried about are things like this. Quote, we will address an issue that can cause the game to forcibly close at certain locations. As a result of this fix, there may be a reduction of Pokemon and people displayed in certain towns or in the wild. The concerning part about that is there's already too few people in Pokemon playing in the, displayed in the wild, and the draw distance is awful. So that's kind of a one step forward, two steps back. 
Uh, when a Pokemon that is not part of the Paldea Pokedex is obtained through a link trade, it is displayed as being registered to the Paldea Pokedex. This bug will be fixed. Um, uh, that's weird. It doesn't really affect anything. So I'm excited about this. Objects such as Pokeballs may be displayed in certain locations of the field unintentionally. That'll be fixed. <laughs> yeah, the Pokeballs go everywhere. Uh, passersby will no longer be displayed during certain battles that take place in towns during the main story. If you remember the hilarious memes of random NPCs, and if you're playing with friends, like walking through your battle right in the middle of a fight, it was hilarious. So that'll be fixed. And then it says um, other bug fixes will be implemented. It says note. We are planning further features and bug fixes not listed in these patch notes. Please check back here for full details when the update data is distributed. Update contents and details are subject to change. So the reason why I'm even talking about this is because they, they're kind of meeting their promise. They're, this bug list is huge. So go check it out. You can just find like Google 1.0 if you care. 1.2.0 patch and you'll get the, the list of everything. There's a whole lot of fixes here. This will make me open the game again and go in and check out some stuff and see what's going on. Because I finished the story of Pokemon Scarlet rather quickly. I loved it. It was amazing. Amazing. Probably the best mainline Pokemon game since, like, Omega Sapphire and Omega Ruby. I don't know why I just used Omega for, but it's Alpha Sapphire and Omega Ruby, which were my favorite ones on the 3DS. So, by far the best Pokemon experience on the Switch, despite the bugs and technical issues. I never did any of the endgame content, so I would like an excuse to go back to go and explore more and do some of the endgame content. Uh, so I'm excited about that. If you are as well, I would love to hear about it. So that wraps up the news segment. And before I jump into my retro discussion, I just want to remind your audience that, or remind you, quote, the audience, that you can find me at 80bitpodsmash.com and you can find Penguin there as well. That's our landing website with links to our social media outlets, Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, Twitter. We have a Discord server. We have a TikTok. You can check us out. Penguin's still regularly posting things on TikTok. So you can go check him out and what he's doing there. Jump into our Discord server and discuss and talk about things with our community. We would love to have any of your feedback about how this show is going, things I talk about here. We already have some active conversations going on, and I'd like to have some guests on the show. I know I've said this before. I haven't put those into fruition yet, but I'm now planning to have some people on the show with me for Termites Buzz. And go check us out. And if you care at all, give us some feedback. So what's going on in the retro world of Termite? I have fallen down another rabbit hole. And this rabbit hole involves the PlayStation 3, which I often fall into rabbit holes. If you could draw a picture, if someone could, like, draw Termite's minefield or, like, just pits, do, like, if you remember that book, Holes, like, the cover where it showed the kid and there's a whole bunch of, like, dirt holes, but a Termite, like, that's me. And all of those holes are PlayStation 3 except, like, the one that was Left 4 Dead Xbox 360. The other hole was Forza that I fell into, but like all the other ones are PlayStation three. Maybe there's a GameCube one. Cause for some reason, I don't understand why the PlayStation three is just near and dear to my heart. And I feel like it's just a big gap that I missed because I was so into the Xbox era at that time, the 360 era. And I had a 360 and that was my main platform. And I played everything that came out from 2006 to 2013 on an Xbox and I just have this dream that I can go back through and re-experience the games that I missed on the PlayStation and get trophies. And games that I missed are stuff like Assassin's Creed, uh, Catherine, Full Body, which is like a JRPG, all the Dragon Age games, all the Mass Effect games, Final Fantasy XIII, the sequel, and its third one. And that's just this top, that's like scratching the surface. There's first party titles like the Resistance Saga. I'd already played through Killzone recently as I go back through like Dead Space, Skate, there's a ton, um, a ton of games that I want to go back and play that I missed entirely during that generation because I was playing other stuff. There's so many games that come out that I can't play everything, and I would love to go back, and, like Fallout 3 and New Vegas. I want to play those on PlayStation 3. So I have this like dream and this love and this like idealized version of me playing retro games all on PlayStation 3, and I love it. I love the titles, the library, the selection. And the first party titles, of course, are great. So there's some Ratchet & Clank games I'd like to go back and play. Anyway, all of that is to say I fell into a rabbit hole for PlayStation 3 because I was on Reddit and I followed the PlayStation 3 subreddit and there was some post with a link to a documentary about the chip failures and the yellow light of deaths that happened on the launch models of PlayStation 3s. And so I went and investigated and you can find 
this video on YouTube. It's R.I.P. Felix, F-E-L-I-X. Uh, he has created two documentaries. One is kind of a, a abridged version, and then there's like the unabridged one. The abridged one's all you need. And it walks through the history, and this is what I found extremely fascinating. I never put together, I don't know why, maybe y'all already did, and I'm just late to the party, the Red Ring of Death from Xbox 360 launch title or launch consoles and the Yellow Light of Death on the launch models of PlayStation 3s. PlayStation uses an NVIDIA chip for its graphics processor and the RSX, which is the graphics chip for PlayStation 3. And Microsoft used an ATI chip. I don't know what it's called for theirs. Both companies, ATI and NVIDIA, sourced their chips from a company called TSMC. Now, they ordered, they designed and engineered ATI and NVIDIA, designed, engineered with extreme diligence and expertise, electrical engineering to a, to the nth degree. I mean, everything from its thermal, thermal profile to like the circuitry internals to what kind of lead to use for soldering and what kind of materials to use in the assembling of the chip. And they both submit those orders to TSMC and TSMC makes them and sends them back to their, they, they fulfill the order, right? So none of this stuff is actually the fault of TSMC. They just did what they were told as far as printing. Like they were just ordering, they received the order and made the chips. Interestingly enough, both ATI and NVIDIA made a grievous mistake with a combination that a combination of incompatible materials for the heat that is generated from this chip. And so it led to hardware failures. And it's interesting to put that together from both the Xbox and the Sony, the PlayStation side of the house and their responses. So with Sony, they tried to cover it all up and they never really talked about it. And there was very little support whenever they did fail. And later hardware revisions came out more frequently for Sony, like the PlayStation 3 Slim, an iterative going from a 90 nanometer processor down to a 65 nanometer processor, which had two revisions in and of itself, going down to a 40 nanometer processor. And you can see how quickly they tried to fix the issue under the hood. Microsoft made a big hubbub about it. They were more public and tried, of course they downplayed it initially, but Microsoft spent a billion dollars to fix this problem and made it right with customers and made new motherboards and different circuits, different heat sinks, et cetera. But they never changed the features of the console. Sony actually removed the backwards compatibility from the PlayStation 3 as they iterated into new hardware in order to save cost. Instead of continuing to manufacture and install PlayStation 2 chips, they went to a software emulation, and I guess support for that waned, and they decided to remove that. So if you have a PlayStation 3 Slim or their third model, the Super Slim, you don't have any PlayStation 2 backwards compatibility at all. And that's why this matters, because as a retro gamer with an extensive collection, it'd be really, really freaking cool to have a PlayStation 3 that can play all PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, and PlayStation 3 games, and then have the PS5 that can do PS4 and PS5 games. Two consoles can play the entire library of PlayStation, which would be off the disc with no emulation, just like actual hardware, except for PS1. I guess PS1 is an emulator on PS3, but that's a rock solid flawless emulator. All PlayStation 3s are backwards compatible with PS1 games, even the newer models. It's I guess it's easy enough to whatever they did. I don't know. But anyway, I fell into this rabbit hole. I watched this documentary about how that all took place, the history of it, how it unfolded, and the reactions from everyone, the gaming industry responses. And then at the very end of this video, it goes into hardware modifications to try and fix this problem. In fact, that's what the documentary is really about, is how do you really fix the PlayStation 3 yellow light of death? What can you do to fix these chips? And tons and tons of research and work from this um, RIP Felix, RIP Felix, has gone into this video, and it's extremely fascinating to me to watch the hardware modification community, the hardware mods doing a ton of electrical engineering work, figuring out what to do to fix these chips. Do you just reflow it by applying heat to the whole circuit board? Do you replace the capacitors? Do you replace the soldering joints that attach the processor chip to the motherboard? Varying levels of complexity for all those fixes. But what fascinated me the most was grafting a newer chip like the 40 nanometer or the 65 nanometer chip onto the motherboard of the original launch PlayStation 3s and they call it the Frankenstein mod and it is 
amazing. I don't know how they do it. The newer chips are made with the correct combination of materials. They don't fail. They operate with different voltage requirements and different heat levels, and yet they can just take the chip off the new one and graft it onto the motherboard of an old one. It's extremely complicated and extremely difficult to do, but there is some people in the world, there are some people in the world that do this mod, and they've done it successfully and repeatable, and it's reliable, and it's extremely expensive. So I got wrapped up into watching some live streams of Computer Booter, who is a person in California who can do this mod, and he has a YouTube and a Twitch, and he has a game store. Uh, it's in, out of Sacramento, California, and I've been watching their streams, jumping into the community, talking to folks about this, and it's so fascinating to watch uh, someone with a camera zoomed in, doing the hardware modification, and making these PlayStation 3s like usable again. I wish it wasn't so expensive. I think he quotes a $600 price to do the Frankenstein mod, and that's that's a lot of money. That's more money than a PlayStation 5 just to play a or have a PlayStation 3 that is backwards compatible, but with a I mean forever. Like that that seems to be the forever switch. Like you do that one time and your PlayStation 3 will won't, theoretically won't die again. So it's really, really, really cool. I'm extremely excited about it. And that's kind of my retro talk for the day. So if you care at all with more information about any of that, go look up RIP Felix's documentary. Go look up Computer Booter. Give him some views, shares, likes, and follows. They don't know that I'm even talking about them on the show here, but I have uh, interacted with them in their streams. And uh, I, can t- I will continue to watch and follow them and see where this takes us for trying to preserve these original PlayStation 3 launch models that I'm obsessed with. I have one. It has been reflowed. It does not work. Uh, it had the capacitors replaced. It still does not work. Uh, not to the fault of the person who did it, which is Fredericksburg Console Mods. So go check him out on Facebook. Uh, if you're in the Fredericksburg area, he is absolutely phenomenal for fixing hardware. I just had a Game Boy Micro and a PS2 repaired from him, and he does a great job and charges extremely fair prices. I highly recommend him for any of your hardware needs. Unfortunately, he does not have the equipment in-house to do a Frank mod, a Frankie, Frankie mod, Frankenstein mod. So maybe one day he will, and I'll have that done. We'll see. So with that, I look forward to seeing you next week. I don't know what the news will bring. I don't know what I'll be continuing to play or what retro discussions I'll have, but I promise you another full episode of content next week. <laughs>